Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to our uh, seventh session today on the um, our uh, seats uh, weekly webinars uh, sponsored by uh, Medtronic. Um, and I'm glad to welcome everybody here on, uh, again on a Monday evening. Um, today we have uh, two very prominent speakers. Um, uh, one is uh, Dr. The first person is Dr. Boon Lawat Homvise, and uh, he's actually an assistant professor in the Department of Surgery. Uh, in Tamasat University, Thailand. And the next person is a very prominent speaker also, Professor Tin Zhao, uh, who is the head of the Department of uh, Thoracic Surgery in uh, Yangon Specialty Hospital in, in Myanmar. So um, I think we've got uh, quite a lot of participants uh, coming in right now. Maybe we will just wait about, uh, maybe about a minute, uh, and then we can probably start our, our session um, um, in about under 60 seconds. Okay. All right. So we'll just wait, uh, just wait for a little bit and then uh, we'll kick it off. Okay, uh, Dr. Bun, Bun Lawat, shall we uh, begin? Okay, uh, sure. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Bun Lawat uh, one more time uh, since everyone's in right now. So Dr. Bun Lawat is actually our assist is a assistant professor in the Department of Surgery in the Faculty of Medicine of uh, Tamasad University, Thailand. Uh, he's a very prominent and upcoming thoracic surgeon um, in uh, Thailand, and he's going to talk to us today on the management of secondary lung cancer. Uh, so take it away, Dr. Bun. Okay, thank you very much. So I beginning time my chair my right. Okay. Okay. Do you see my slide? Uh, yes, I, we can okay. see it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So first of all, I would like to thank the seat organization committee that to inviting me here. So my topic is about the management of uh, secondary lung cancer. So. After the liver lung is the most common site of metastatic involvement, the first book shows the primary tumor that most commonly metastasized to the lung. And these tumors are commonly found because of its uh, greater preference, such as say, uh, breast cancer, colon cancer, or kidney cancer. And the second box shows that the tumor that has the highest uh, predilection of primary metastasis, such as choriocarcinoma, osteosarcoma, or testicular tumor, or soft tissue sarcoma. So beginning with the evaluation of a patient with secondary lung cancer. So for the clinical presentation, around 75 to 90% of patients are asymptomatic. And most of the disease is more commonly found during the routine examination or during the surveillance of a primary tumor. And symptoms when they do occur, typically they related with the endobronchial lesion or pleural involvement. So for the imaging, CT scan is a standard initial investigation for lung metastasis. And CT scan can provide many important information, such as a uh, number of the tumors, the location of a tumor, is the tumor located centrally or peripherally, and the resectability of a tumor. If you found new nodule in the patient with prior malignancy, this nodule should be considered cancer until proof otherwise. And 25% of the patient has multiple lesions, and this lesion prefer peripherally, more than century, and they prefer the basal lung fill. And the tumor is normally well circumscribed with smooth border. For the cuff patient, is a rare finding, except for a patient with osteosarcoma, chondrosarcoma, breast cancer, and ovary cancer. And the finding of cavitation is also rare, but you can find in the patient with squamous cell carcinoma, sarcoma, and testicular tumor. For PET CT, uh, PET CT is a very useful tool. PET scan can provide a very, uh, a very impor important information, which is a detection of extrathoracic metastasis. And if you found that patient has extrathoracic metastasis, this may exclude the patient from the 
potential curative resection. So normally, PET is uh, recommended as a part of initial patient evaluation. What about preoperative luminal staging? The incidence of luminal metastasis is depend on historical subtype. The overall incidence is around 20 to 25 percent, and the coronal cancer, breast cancer, and renal carcinoma has higher prevalence. While sarcoma, melanoma, and germ cell tumor has a lower number uh, of the luminal metastasis. So this table shows the incidence of luminal involvement at the time of primary metastasectomy. As you can see, that there are lots of reports. And the interesting one is the report on 2014 uh, for, for the coronal cancer patient. And they found that up to 44% of the patient has luminal metastasis at the time of surgery. So you can see the numbers is quite high. It's almost a half of the patient that have luminal metastasis during the surgery. More importantly, lymph node metastasis has an effect on patient survival. There are a lot of studies that but show the same result. You can see in this uh, table, lymph node metastasis patient has significantly better outcome, a significantly, sorry, significantly worse outcome uh, with only 10 to 35 years survival. While the patient without lymph node metastasis, the outcome is much better. You can see that around 40, 50, up to 70% of five years survival of the patient. So for preoperative state of medicine of lymph node is an important information. So selective lymph management based on risk and benefit ratio of surgery is recommended. And invasive medicine of lymph node staging is indicated if the preoperative imaging show lymphadenopathy in the medicinum. What about preoperative tissue diagnosis? Normally, Tissue diagnosis should be considered when the management plan of the patient is going to change if you, the, if you know the diagnosis. You can done by either endoscopic or percutaneous approach based on patient risk, uh, local expertise, and of course, location of the nodules. And normally, we recommend uh, to do the preoperative tissue diagnosis in non surgical candidate patient or patient who refuse surgery. What about surgery in, in, in this kind of patient? There are four main indications for surgery in, uh, in the primary metastasectomy. The first one, the most common indication, and, and I think the, the main reason that do, we do the primary metastasectomy is uh, for curative resection. And the surgery that we do, we aim for improve the survival of the patient with the stage four cancers. Other indications, including tissue diagnosis for evaluation of a residual disease or for treatment of a uh, tumor-related complications uh, such as hemoptysis, pneumothorax, or hemothorax. For curative resection, th these are all the criteria that uh, lung metastasis patients need to fulfill before being considered primary metastasectomy. The first, the first one is primary tumor site has to be controlled either by complete resection or have any evidence that there was no local recurrence of a primary tumor. And the patient should have no extrathoracic metastasis. Or if, if they have, this, this metastasis should be treated with complete resection too. And the surgeon uh, should have a confidence before do the surgery that they can perform complete or R0 resection. And on the patient side, they should fit enough to tolerate lung surgery, and there was no better alternative treatment at that time. About surgical principle, the extent of resection the most important rule is the R0 resection or complete resection. And not like lung cancer, uh, in, in metastasectomy, lung parenchymal sparing resection is a preferred principle. So most, most of the cases that we do, we can do only wet resection. If you can obtain the free margin, it's okay. But in some cases, if the tumor is, is quite big, like more than three centimeters, or tumor is located centrally, sometimes you need to do segmentectomy or even lobectomy uh, to aim to uh, do the complete dissection. But normally we don't recommend to do pneumonectomy uh, in the routine practice. For surgical margin, the suggestion is vary from five millimeters to 20 millimeters uh, for the margins, but normally we accept at least one centimeters or at least uh, more than tumor size. So this is our report uh, published in 2019 from MD Anderson Cancer Center in US. And they study of 
almost 700 wet resection patients in uh, colorectal pulmonary metastasis. And they found that the longer the margin length, the lower the risk of the local recurrence. And you can see in the graph, the general line represent the margin length of two centimeters. You, have a, you can see that there is a very low local recurrence rate compared with the one millimeter margin length uh, in the blue line. The recurrence rate is quite high. And another important finding in this paper is the tumor size affect the risk of a local recurrence. As you can see, the green line, the tumor size more than two centimeters has a freedom from local recurrence very low. When compared to the tumor size less than one centimeter, have a high freedom from local recurrence. And this paper also found that margin length, if equal to the 50% of tumor size, the local recurrence is around 11%. But if the margin length is equal to tumor size, the local recurrence is less than 7%. So this study concluded that margin length were associated with the risk of a local recurrence. And the risk of local recurrence of larger tumor were diminished by sufficient margin, margin length. And on the other hand, there was another, another study from Korean in 2019. Uh, they studied about impact of a margin length and tumor depth on the local recurrence after red wedge resection of a colorectal metastasis. They studied in 65 patients and they found that Local recurrence doesn't correlate with the thin of a resection margin. Like you can see in the picture that the green line is the resection margin more than one centimeter or more than tumor size. And the red line is the tumor margin less than 10, one, 10 millimeter or less than tumor size. And you can find that there was no difference on the local recurrence. Another important finding is uh, about tumor depth. If the patient is, uh, if a tumor depth is more than 25 millimeters, a local recurrent is significantly higher after wet resection. So in this study, they conclude that complete resection is more important than resection margin. And for central tumor or depth more than 25 millimeters, cementectomy or orobectomy are the preferred methods. What about surgical approach? The choice of between wet and open uh, surgery is uh, used to be a controversial issue. The key difference between these two approaches is how the surgeon identify the lesion of the lung. For wet surgery, we rely mostly on the preoperative imaging or CT scan. But for the open surgery, we can palpate the lung, so we can find a nodule during the surgery. So, and there are many reports say that in wet surgery, wet approach, you may miss a lesion up to maybe 20%. So like in this study in 2010, they review accuracy of a helical CT scan and they found that up to 25% of patients has missed lesion uh, during the CT scan. And you can see only one study that used three to five slight thickness millimeter CT scan. So this finding cannot imply into the current situation because you, are, you know that the technology is, is much more better and we normally use one to three millimeter slight thickness CT in the routine practice. So another important question is even we miss any lesion on wet surgery, is there an impact on patient survival? So this is a systemic review on 2015, and they found that WET has slightly better outcome. Uh, one, three year and five year overall survival is slightly better. And also the one, three and five year rec recurrence free survival is better when you compare to the open group. So they conclude that WET offers a suitable alternative to open trachotomy for pulmonary metastasectomy. And this is a very recent study on 2020. And they found that wet has a little bit slightly better outcome too. Uh, like disease free to interval is uh, around 22 months in West group compared with open is 19 months. And a five year survival is slightly better to 20, 61% versus 49%. Even the, the, they cannot reach the statistical significance, but uh, they can say that wet has a comparable outcome when compared to the open surgery. So we conclude that right now in the current ELA that we have better preoperative imaging quality. What is now the preferred approach because it's less invasive, they provide less pain and less complication after surgery with the acceptable long-term outcome. So for the young surgeon, you have to keep in mind that when you do the wet metastasectomy, sometimes you encounter a very small lesion or you have a very deep lesion that you cannot find during the wet uh, procedures. So this is a lovely integration that may you may need the pre-op localization of the tumor before you uh, do the surgery, such as size less than 10 millimeters or 
the tumor is deep formed through space more than five millimeters. What about medial, medial slim node dis dissection? As I already told you that limb node metastasis had an effect on patient survival and preoperative CT or PET CT can have a false, uh, false negative result up to 17%. So we recommend uh, either limb node sampling or limb node dissection should be done concomitantly with uh, primary metastasectomy. And normally if you found limb node metastasis after operation, uh, it, it may be the indication for adjuvant treatment afterward. About alternative treatment, such as a thermal abrasion like RF abrasion or microwave abrasion, or stereotactic ablative body radiotherapy, there are some evidence showing the good result of this alternative treatment. And right now, we, we think that alternative treatment like an additional tool uh, for treatment for the patient. And we normally recommend the alternative treatment for the patient with high surgical risk, or they have an ipsy retro recurrent after a prior primary metastasectomy, or they refuse surgery. So this is a cancer-specific consideration. Um, because limited of time, so I will pick only the one that uh, I think is common in, in the current practice. So I'm beginning with coronal cancer. 5 to 15% of the colon cancer has lung metastasis. And 6% of colon cancer was isolated lung, and 12% in rectal cancer has isolated lung metastasis. And a five-year survival of stage four cancer who were treated with only adjuvant treatment is, is only 5%. So the in indication for surgery normally is the same. You, you, you want to offer the, the better survival for the patient. So this is a surgical outcome that report in 2018. Uh, they reviewed more than 8,000 patients from 21 study. The five-year survival is so, is vary from 24% to 82%, and the median overall survival is vary from 35 to 70 months. You can see that the result is quite vary. So you have to know, you have to pick a good patient to do the surgery to you, if you want a better result. So how do you know? You need to know the prognosis factors. This is at the list of the bad prognosis factors. If the patient has short disease free interval, let's say less than 12 months or one year, they tend to have worse prognosis. The number of lung metastasis is also another issue. Most of the guidelines recommend that if you have more than three nodules, maybe the patient uh, has a worse prognosis and they don't recommend to do the primary metastasectomy. But anyway, the number of nodules is not like a cutoff point. It's not an absolute contraindication for the patient. Normally, uh, we use a lot of uh, factors to, to determine which, uh, which one is the most best treatment for the patient, not only one practice. Another factor is the involvement of high lung or medicinal lymph node involvement. It's a bad prognosis factor. And the last one is the elevated preoperative CDA. If more than five nanograms per millilitre, it's also another bad prognosis factor. What about repeat metastasectomy? You can do it. The incidence of repeat PM is up to 24%. The indication is the same as the first one. And we have a, like, a comparable outcome if you select the patient well. What about preoperative chemotherapy? It's another uh, controversy issue. There was a review in 2017. They reviewed six retrospective studies. None of study were able to demonstrate effect on the overall survival. But there's some improvement in disease for free survival and progression free survival in subgroup of patients, such as multiple or metachronous lung lesion. Currently, we still lack of a strong evidence, but normally we recommend to use uh, chemotherapy on, in every lung metastasis patient, either an adjuvant setting or neoadjuvant setting. But for the neoadjuvant setting, we recommend to use in the patient with large burden of disease. For sarcoma, 22 to 40% have lung metastasis and most of them are isolated. Indication is the same because of sarcoma is, is quite resistant to chemotherapy. So in patient with lung metastasis, surgery is a preferred treatment with more aggressive strategy. Five years survival is quite okay, 30 to 50 percent. And this is a list of a good prognosis factor in this group of patients. What about germ cell tumor? Lung is the most common site of visceral metastasis. And not like in contrast with sarcoma, germ cell tumor is a, has a very good response to chemotherapy. So chemotherapy is the first line of treatment. Over 10 to 20 percent of patients that require surgery after that. 
And this is an indication for pulmonary metastasectomy in germ cell tumor. The most common one is the, the if the patient receives a complete treatment of a chemotherapy and the tumor marker is stabilized, but they still have some residual tumor more than one centimeter. This is an indication for pulmonary metastasectomy. For the contraindication, if uh, the disease is progressed or the clinical patient is prohibiting surgery, so this is a contraindication. Surgical so principle is the same. Normally, we wait around one month after chemotherapy. And there was a finding from a study. They, they found that 95% uh, of the patient has paradigmal concordance between lungs in patients with bilateral lung metastasis. So if you, do, if you have a patient after chemotherapy and they, they have two, two nodules in both lungs, you, you start on one lung first and you wait for the pathological diagnosis. If they come back necrosis, the, another lesion on another lung can be observed rather than, rather than the sex. And uh, surgical outcome is very good, five years survival up to 90%. So for the conclusion, primary metatosectomy is now the treatment of choice in appropriate selected patients with metatosic disease to the lung. Complete dissection is the key to success. The law of surgery may be changed due to an improvement of systemic treatment regimens or an experience with less invasive techniques. And MDT is very important to determine the best treatment for individual patients. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much for the very inform informative talk, Dr. Boon. Um, we will take the questions uh, later at the end of the day. Um, so we move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Prof. Tin Zou, and uh, he's actually the head of um, uh, thoracic surgery department at Yangon Specialty Hospital, Myanmar. And uh, today, Prof. Wu will be giving us a talk on management of benign lung tumors. Uh, so, Prof. Wu, um, you can um, take the floor. Sorry, um, um, uh, moderator, can I get uh, Prof. Wu as the uh, main speaker video? Hello, do and, you uh, hear me? And do yes, you okay, I can see you now, Doctor. Right. So, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. Good evening, Harish, and everyone. So, now it's my pleasure to, to have a talk in this uh, webinar series. And I'm Prof. Tinzo from Myanmar. And <clears throat> my hospital is in Yangon and called the Yangon Specialty Hospital. So, I'm going to talk on the management of benign lung tumors. So when we consider benign lung tumors and tumor-like lesions are always included because they are histologically different, but the clinically they are the same and they share the same, the same clinical features. And this is my content of presentation. And at first I start with the introduction. It is a rare tumor and mostly slow growing tumor. And it can be endobronchial or bronchioma. So each of which share separate etiology and <clears throat> clinical features and management. And it can be a bit layer or mesenchymal in tissue origin, therefore so heterogeneous. And truly, it can be true neoplasm or inflammatory or fibrotic reactive tumor lesions. So it can be asymptomatic or with chest symptoms. And chest X-ray and CT are the primary tool to detect the lesion. And bronchoscopic procedures may be diagnostic as well as therapeutic. And finally, the aspiration is sometimes initial pathological diagnosis. And cytopathologist may be under pressure in some situations, and he or she has to be very careful not to miss malignancy to alter the management guideline outline. And may I review some historical perspective? This is from the archives of otolaryngology published in 1930 by Patterson, MD. And he reviewed bronchoscopic removal of benign bronchial neoplasm. And this review seems to be very, very early in the history of thoracic diseases. So in this review, uh, it only, sorry, only 16 patients, starting from 1907 to 1929, so around about 22 years, uh, 
and the age varies from six year old child to 74 year, 74 year old man. And so different surgeons and different diagnosis. And the, and, and I arranged the diagnosis with the mostly fibroma from the main bronchus, whether from the left or the right, or sometimes uh, both bronchi. And some are fibrous polyboid and fibrolipoma. And pure lipoma is included. And there are several polyps and two granulomas and chondroma and papilloma, etc. Anyway, this is very interesting review. And this is the Ave Abraham Livor. He, he published in 1952. He's a famous uh, pulmonary pathologist, especially for benign lesions. But he can describe only papilloma, hemangioma, fibroma, chondroma, lipoma, granular cell myoblastoma, and localized tumor of the pleura. At that period, the proper classification of the benign lung lesion has not been well established. And this is another article in 1963 by Steele. So he studied a 10 year period with all benign and malignant lesions that included 887 patients with incidental SPN in chest X-ray. And non-malignant lesions comprised 64%, and most were granulomas, so there is not real benign neoplasia. And he noted only 10% of true neoplastic lesions were benign. And this is his presentation, and hematoma comprises 65 cases, and most are granuloma and many miscellaneous lesions like bronchiosis, subdural limb nodes, and everything, AV fistula, and even pleural chest wall tumors. And another article was published in 1964 by Sebo, and he described uh, many cases and from 22 reports in 12 years, starting from 1948 to 1963, with more than 2,000 cases but the only cancer comprises only 37.8%. But no histopathological description was not found in, in the series, and I guess 62.2% were non malignant So another interesting 10 years such an experience of benign tumors were made by Marco G. Arigoni, and he described the hematoma, the most frequent benign tumor, and 100 cases out of 130, and others are benign fibrous mesothelioma, and lipoma, leomyoma, hemangioma, et cetera, et cetera. And from the era of chest X-ray and thoracotomy to deal the SPN or GGO, and we evolved CT, PET, TBNA, TTNB, and VETS. All these impact on management of SPN and endobronchial lesions in their uh, frequency and their characteristics and management outcome. So I like to move to classification. The pathologist classification versus clinician's report are quite different. And the pathologist classification based on the origin of tissue and they were systematic, but the, the varieties are very diverse and heterogeneous and widespread scattered and quite boring to learn. And the clinician's report are quite interesting because they're based on the frequency of occurrence, but it also depends on center, and it depends on personal interest, and it depends on the period of study. And these are the list of uh, classification. They started from 1938 as mesoderma, endoderma, and mix, and Jackson by benign malignant borderline, and Libu in 1952, not really true classification. And Ackerman described in his second edition of textbook, and the, the not, not too perfect, and Spencer as well. And Don R. Miller in 1969 described, he's, he's the thoracic surgeon, as well as pathologist, and, uh, and he described three varieties of uh, classification, three, three varieties. First is trachea, the, those belong to trachea and major bronchi, and those belong to trachea and major bronchi or lung parenchyma, and those belong to vista bronchial tree and lung parenchyma. Miller's classification began more systematic. And the first belonged to papilloma, polyp, leomorphic adenoma, uh, other adenoma, oncocytoma, granular cell, myoblast, everything. 
and the second was <clears throat> this is the another series that contains uh, 360 360 patients but we see only uh, 22 varieties uh, out of 34 patients uh, out of one 360 patient we found only benign tumors in uh, 34 patients and 22 varieties among 34 patients is very ridiculous and one or two cases for, for histology. And leomyoma and neurogenic tumor, are, according to Miller's classification, they can occur everywhere. And this the bron bronchial tree and the lung parenchyma, hematoma, AV fistula, sclerosing hemangioma, plasma cell tumor, xanthoma, thymoma, and teratoma. These are his classification. So there are many disagreements on the classification in terms of etiology, malignant potential, cellular makeup, site of origin, etc. So therefore, the WHO classification started in 1999 and edited again in 2004 to consider epithelial, mesenchymal, miscellaneous, and tumor-like condition. And this is the comparison between the Debo's classification, Miller's classification, and WHO classification. Now we move to 2015, the ratio classification of lung tumor is uh, updated and more significant. And again, the group into four groups and epithelial, mesenchymal, lymphohistiocytic, and tumors of atopic origin. One interesting thing is the ICDO code is applied. The code three, two, one, and zero implies separately, and three as malignant, two as CIS or grade one, and uncertain for one, and benign, purely benign as zero. So this is the 2015 WHO classification. These are epithelial tumors, mesenchymal tumors, lymphohistocytic tumors. And the peculiar thing is there is no benign tumor in the lymphohistocytic variety. And another thing is tumor ectopic origin and metastatic tumors. So one interesting point is that pre-invasive lesions, the atypical adenomatous hyperplasia and adenocarcinoma in situ are regarded as benign tumors. And in neuroendocrine tumors, pre-invasive pre lesion of diffuse idiopathic pulmonary neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia is classified as benign. And in salivary gland type, pleomorphic adenoma is benign. And epithelial origin tumors, so here everything is benign. And the one interesting point is previously known as sclerosing hemangioma are now uh, classified as sclerosing pneumocytoma because this, this variety contains no vascular cellular structures according to the immunohistochemistry and it comprises only pneumocytes. And in mesenchymal tumors, pulmonary hematoma is the first, uh, the most frequent, and chondroma. And another picoma is the clear cell tumor is benign. The, in mesenchyma, the myoepithelioma is another benign variety. And in lymphohistiocytic tumors, as I said, no benign tumor. And tumor of ectopic origin and some mature teratoma and meningioma are the benign tumor. So there are more than 30 histological types and very exhausting, as I said, to learn these topological types in detail. And even reading the list is confusing. And again, Non-neoplastic inflammatory conditions are more common than true neoplasm. So this is a, a series of publications uh, regarding the groups of frequency and histology. And if you look all these things, they are diverse and only one or two cases. And the first start in 1930 with Patterson, uh, that I have just described, and still, uh, so everything, uh, Hematoma is the commonest one. So comprises here 7.3% and this is a five out of 16 cases and 76.9%, 58, 54. So hematoma is the most frequent purely benign neoplasm in lung tumors. So let's go to presentation. The presentation depends on location of the tumor, size of the tumor, vascularity of the tumor and discharge present or absence of discharge or mucus and depends on complications. And the presentation, it, is, it can be asymptomatic and incidental finding 
of GGO SPN in Chesa is real city. And these are the one third or two third of patients are asymptomatic. When they give symptoms, the symptoms are chest symptoms with abnormal bronchoscopic finding and like shortness of breath, unexplained cough without a sputum, and rarely experience hemoptysis. And sometimes chest comfort, strider and wheezing, and recurrent pneumonia, obstructive pneumonia, and some may complicate by the bronchiectasis, lung abscess, and epilepsis. Emergency conditions are rare for benign tumor, but not, not, uh, not, not never, and it can be massive hemoptysis or asphyxia and metastatic shift. So the diagnosis. The diagnosis may be delayed because they are asymptomatic and maybe normal in routine chest x-ray or uh, medical checkup, and it can simulate even they have symptoms. They can simulate asthma, COPD, exacerbation, and chest infection. CD has a good role in diagnosis of benign lesions. It can present with GGO or SPN and trachea or bronchial mass and distal bronchial dilatation with nuclear infection, post obstructive pneumonia, bronchiectasis, lung abscess, or subsegmental activity disease, or air trapping. So I like to refer to Harish talk on GGO management in this month, in this webinar series. And he described the eight parameters, size, location, size, location, attenuation, shape and border, growth, classification of fat, cavitation, and contrast enhancement, or RIN and RIN. I, I do not have a, I do not like to mention it again. The advanced CT technologies is available now and multi-detector CT with thin section reconstruction, post-processing techniques like multi-planner, reformation, volume rendering, and virtual bronchoscopy are very useful in locating the exact location and for better description of tumor morphology. Internet feature of tumors are well described and extramural extension and invasion can be known in detail and longitudinal involvement and extents of luminous stenosis can be known. And this is the CD features of benign intrabronchial lesion. And the technology is very good for delineating the exact anatomy and location of the tumor. And MRI, when CD is unavailable or when Radiation hazard is to be avoided due to repeated uh, CDs. MRI is use, useful. And it is useful in fat containing lesions like lipoma or hematoma. Bronchoscopy is routine and you can visualize directly and you can ex know exact location and you can sample the tissue. Management. Regarding the management, the multidisciplinary team is essential in, in selected cases and radiologist, pulmonologist, thoracic surgeon, anesthesiologist, and cytopathologist, histopathologist should make multidisciplinary team and make the decision. Rapid on-site examination or present session become essential cooperation of diagnosis and treatment decision nowadays. So management approaches can be observation or endoscopic management or surgical intervention. The observation is indicated in asymptomatic patients in whom the lesion is likely to be benign based on the clinical context and literature findings. And trial of steroids or antibiotics uh, can be done uh, when the lesion is thought to be secondary to a chronic inflammatory process. And a trial of cytotoxic agents and even antiviral agents may be done in case uh, HPV is suspected etiology of the lesion in whom debugging may not be credible. Uh, this is the suggestion by Edra Well in 2015 in, in his article, Benign Endobronchial Neoplasms, a review article. Endoscopic management is locally destructive techniques and electro snare very frequently done and laser is popular and APC is good, but it takes some time and microwave ablation, cryotherapy, uh, with or without concomitant staining. It depends on the expertise and it depends on the center and availability and human resource. So may I give credit to my colleague, Palmer Lodges in Yangon, 
special hospital and he took the endobronchial lesion inspected and diagnosed and then he prepared to snare it takes some time but the, the snaring is effective and this is electrocautery after good grip and as the lesion is dislodged uh, it is removed later by faucet after that the lesion is inspected thoroughly and any residual lesions can be uh, dissected with electrocautery again. So the endobronchial procedures are very helpful, especially in this era of flexible bronchoscopy. So there are some pros and cons of using flexible rigid scope. If the patient is in good overall status and good minimal comorbidities, uh, with, it can be done with local anesthesia and sedation especially for small and pedunculated mass. And some sessile lesions can be done uh, with the uh, learning curve. And so this is the preferred first line management. And rigid bronchoscope is required with general anesthesia. And if the procedure is anticipated more than 30 minutes and with poor cardiopulmonary reserve, and if the lesion is broad based, large or vascular, and afraid of loss of airway from tumor or bleeding. And the surgical management is required when complication or potential complication is present. And if the malignancy cannot be excluded by uh, preoperative uh, evaluation, then we have to apply the Fishner's guideline and NCCN guideline. So this is the, the 2017 guidelines, uh, Fishner guidelines. So it depends on whether the nodule is solid or subsolid whether the nodule is single or multiple, and whether it's the, the nodule belongs to low risk and high risk, and it depends on the size. And we can decide if there are no follow-up, it's okay, and we need interval follow-up, or we proceed to resection. And the risk stratification in low risk belongs to less than 35 years, non-smoker and high risk uh, depends on age, smoking status, uh, quit status, and history of exposure to inhaled carcinogen, history of COPD, fibrosis, scar, and family history of cancer. This is the patient factor, and this is the, the CD factor. So the size is a, a determinant, and the lobe is sometimes helpful to decide whether they're risky or not. And the size of nodule, and speculated margin, upper lobe location, and the number of loops no juice. Uh, the big, big number tends to be benign, and whether it's one to four number can be malignant. And the growth rate, the doubling time, is different for solid and subsolid tumors in determining high risk or not. Surgical treatment comprises trigger resection, crinal resection, a sleeve resection, or wedge resection is simple and maybe enough, and segmentectomy is not, not not required and only seg segmentectomy is for spared for small lesion with uh, unsure of diagnosis. And sometimes we have to end up with lobectomy or pneumonectomy in critical conditions. So these are the indications for surgical intervention. All parenchymal lesions required to be removed are surgically resected and the, some trigger bronchial lesions where the histologic specimen cannot exclude malignancy or significant complication with bronchiectasis or organizing pneumonia, post-operative post pneumonia, and the tumor infiltration to the bronchial wall, or if there is distal to tumor obstruction. This is according to Igawa's uh, suggestion. The surgical principle is to preserve the airway or normal lung as much as possible, and two to four millimeter margin is usually safe for trigger bronchial tree. And preoperative assessment of the local lesion is the key point to tailor the surgical plan. And diagnostic bronchoscopy must be done by the surgeon 
just before the operation or maybe under anesthesia. We have to check at the time of operation again. Uh, let me share my own experience. Actually, our own experience very few and very limited. So I can review four years back and with three or four cases per year. And I cannot say which is the majority and what I detected are hematomas, adenoma, left lower lobe, and adenochondroma, bronchiadenoma, AVM, fibroma, hemangioma, hemangiopericytoma, neuroendocrine, hyperplasia. So three or four cases per year. So I'm very sorry because 2020 with COVID, no patient comes for a benign lesion. But very strange, this morning, 27 July 2020, I got our case. So this is the bronchoscopic view. And this is the... So I just did it and there is a smooth tumor in the right in, in, intermediate bronchus and the smooth outline uh, almost obstructing the lumen with some fat component. It looks benign and I have to walk up for preoperative evaluation, whether the endoscopic procedure or by bronchotomy or bronchoplastic. So we need to evaluate. And this is another case. And I did a true cut biopsy of the lung by CD guided, since it is a peripheral lesion. And this is a true cut specimen and it turns out to be the hemangioma, right upper lobe. This later end up with the resection. The, this another example is the 52 year woman with incidental fine SPNN, right upper lobe. I started with the since the CD features are very benign, I started with the, the true gut biopsy and the histology came back as the hemangiopericytoma. So after that, uh, wedge excision has been done. And another case, 38 year male with the benign looking uh, lesion and the excise. This is an excise specimen and this is a histology and the AV malformation. And this is the incidental finding of 58 year old female, a benign looking mass and excised by wedge excision by my, my colleague. And this is a cartilage component and glandular component. So the histology came back as the adenochondroma. And another case that 80 year old men, incidental finding of SPN in right lower lobe and readily resected since the CD features are very benign. And this is the cut section and close up view. And this is the hematoma, pulmonary hematoma. So actually we have no, no much cases and I, I have to review some test book of interesting cases. And this is the, the test book and the Cambridge University of Red Lung and Mies Canada Chemistry. And this is a, one interesting thing is that, that the patient develops a lung mass, like very malignant looking. And FNAC was done and came back as adenocarcinoma. But the patient's condition is not favorable. And so they can't proceed to surgery but later, a few months after that, the lesion disappear. Then they, they start uh, second biopsy. And this came, came back as the uh, uh, pneumocytoma, sparrowing pneumocytoma. And this is another interesting case from the test book. And this is a, a hematological malignancy with a cytotoxic drugs in the very old woman, 81 year old woman. And this, the, the lesion was by the CD guided tissue biopsy. And the biopsy came back as bronchiolitis obliterant with organizing pneumonia. And this is another interesting article for the prevalence of benign disease in patients undergoing resection for suspected lung cancer. So this was from the, the Analysis of thoracic surgery, 2006. So 
So it is a retrospective analysis uh, for 13 years and 1,560 patients who underwent pulmonary resection for SPI. And out of 1,500, 140 patients were benign, so the 9% postoperatively benign. And the, out of the 140 patients, the needle biopsy has been done in 43 patients. So 29 came back as non-diagnostic and five negative and four positive for cancer. So this is the fourth positive. So as you see at the frequency distribution of that, that cases, granuloma, majority and hematoma, 17 and 14 are pneumonitis and others. Like abscess, aspergilloma, amyloid, bronchogenesis. And so in my study, we have many granuloma and uh, so, so mycetoma. So I, I do not mention about these lesions because they are not, not true tumors. And these are the references. And may I send some take home message. The incidence of benign lung tumor is very low, but the origin of tumor is heterogeneous. And the most frequent types are hematoma, solitary fibrous tumor, and sclerosing pneumocytoma. And the clinical diagnosis mimic malignancy even by FNAC. And management of tracheal bronchial lesion may be easy or challenging. And multidisciplinary team may be needed for clinical decision. So thank you for uh, watching the talk. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. That was a great talk. Um, uh, so right now, um, I guess uh, we can uh, move on to the question and answers uh, session. Um, so actually my first question I uh, would like to go out to Dr. Boone um, is that um, how many metastases is uh, a suitable number for a metastectomy? Difficult to answer, but in the guideline, there was a STS guideline and they say that maybe use three as a, like a primary cut point. If more than three, maybe the result is, uh, is worse. But anyway, in the real life practice, I don't use only one factors. And there are a lot of uh, studies show that you need a lot of factors to determine the, 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 the planning for the patient. If the patient has four nodules, five nodules, but it's, it's stable for some time and there was no other, another metastasis and there was no alternative treatment for the patient. Oh, the systemic treatment is not work for the patient. So maybe you, you need to do surgery in this kind of patient. So I so think the number is not uh, the, the only indication. So would you be aggressive uh, in the sense that if you cannot do a wedge resection, say there are three lesions in the upper lobe and one in the low lobe, would you be aggressive in the point that perform an upper lobectomy and a wedge of a lower lobe lesion or something like that? Yeah, sometimes I do like a one lobectomy and a multiple wedge lesion at, at the rest of the round. It depends on 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 uh, what is the finding of the tumor, and is this aim for cure or not? If you aim for cure and we want to do the best, I think sometimes you have to do like a one lobectomy and some wedge resection. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we got another question here: Is that do you routinely perform lymph node uh, sampling or mediastinal lymph node sampling or dissection during your your metastectomy? Yes, yes. I, I routinely do the lymph node uh, sampling most of the time. But in the case that like colorectal cancers, that we know that they have a lot of a high prevalence of a lymph node metastasis. So I tend to do like a lymph node dissection. I see. Okay. All right. So we know from the studies that uh, lymph node dissection uh, is, uh, it doesn't improve survival, but it definitely yeah, improves right. prognostication for the patient. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, uh, Prof, there's a, uh, one question um, about uh, following up with lung lesions. Now, if you suspect the lesion is benign, uh, do you actually do something about it? Do you follow up the patient uh, or do you uh, start investigating from the beginning? So, um, so it depends on, so as I said, it depends on, oh, sorry. So it depends on the risk factors, whether, so I already described them so single or multiple or so solid or subsolid, so, uh, so nodule size and uh, high risk or low risk. So, so, so in case of uh, controversy, uh, we, we have a tumor board or we, we take a 
chest conference that includes uh, pulmonologists, radiologists, and event pathologists. So the board decision is based on the Flissner's guideline and NCCN guideline. So a, so a lot of patients in uh, this day and age, uh, they are very worried about uh, lesions, even though they're benign. Uh, they want it to be resected out. Would you take patients' consideration into your uh, management plan? Sure, sure, sure. It, it's, it's individualized. And the patients, uh, we explain the patient the possibility of benign or malignancy, and we, we start uh, the deciding whether observe or so resect. Okay. Okay, so we've got some questions here coming from the audience. Um, uh, Dr. Lewin from uh, Myanmar would like to ask a question. How will, uh, Dr. Boon, how will you differentiate synchronous multiple primary lung cancers and primary metastasis? Uh, sometimes it's difficult. Um, you need like a, like a, there was the criteria that you need, that you need a pathological examination in, in both lesion to is that the same or is different in like uh, in detail about the pathological response? So if it's the same, it's maybe like a metastasis or it's different. So it's maybe like a multiple primary lung cancers. So you need a pathological report to, to differentiate that kind of tumor. Okay, good. So we have another question from you, um, from Michael Harden. Uh, Dr. Boone, um, do you see a role for uh, primary metastectomy in breast cancer? with under three solitary palmy nodules, uh, if it's an ipsilateral and there's an N1 node present. So would you consider this as a systemic disease and best managed with medical oncology, or would you uh, consider resection? So for breast cancer, it's, um, it's quite, um, we saw how many metastasis, metastasis is not that good, but if you have N1, uh, N1 node and uh, round T, no dues in the young woman. Sometimes I think the, the best treatment right now is a systematic treatment. But another pro prognostic factor for CA breast is uh, uh, hormonal receptors. If the, this patient has hormonal receptor positive, uh, they maybe have a better outcome with the primary metastasectomy more than the one that has negative re receptors. So I think the best treatment at first treatment is a system systematic treatment. And you do you look for the 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 result of the treatment. If it's getting better, maybe you consider primary metastasectomy after that. Great, uh, Prabhu, any comments on that? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, Dr. Edgardo uh, Polante from uh, Philippines now uh, will answer another question. He says, uh, any particular surveillance or management strategies for pulmonary metastasis which disappear after new adjuvant chemotherapy? So they give the chemo and uh, the lesion has completely shrunk and disappeared. So how any, do you have any surveillance or management strategies for these patients? Normally I, I maybe fill up a CT scan uh, around maybe uh, initially three months and then after six months. If there are any progression of a, the disease or the, the one that maybe disappear and they get bigger. So maybe you need a tissue diagnosis on that node too. Yeah. Yep, I, I actually we, we see that commonly here too. We've seen them uh, on Zilox, they, they shrink, and then when they follow up treatment, uh, it actually enlarges again. So yeah. I think our oncologists uh, have, uh, they're, they're very, in Singapore here, they, they do CT scans very regularly for these patients or every four months, and they monitor them for the first two years. So um, um, I, I don't know, what, what, what's your oncology uh, uh, strategies in, um, in, in Thailand? Yeah, yeah, quite the same. They, they look after the patient, a CT scan. Yeah, around three to six months, it depends on how they worry. Yeah, or at least two years too. Great. Um, so Dr. Nara um, uh, has a question, uh, Dr. Nara from Malaysia. Uh, he asked, uh, what is the localization method that you would recommend uh, for metastatic nodules? If you do VATS, uh, do you do hook wire? Do you do methylene blue? Do you do ICG? Do you do the coiling? Uh, what, what 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 do you do? In your I show? do I do two techniques. The first one is a hook wire. In, in the past, we I use hook wire as my routine, but right now I have a spatial scope, so I switch to ICG. Yeah. 
Okay, so you only do ICG or you do like uh, dual localization? You, what do you mean? I mean ICG localization preoperatively. Okay. okay. You inject the ICG and then I put the patient in the OR. Okay. And it's turned out pretty well for you so far, the ICGs? I think most of the time, but sometimes um, if you delay, if you like do in the morning and, and you do surgery in the afternoon, sometimes the ICG is, is spread away. I don't know. Yeah. But hook wind is, is more solid. You, you, you're sure that the hook wind is, is in, in, in place, but uh, it's more invasive for me, for the, and also for the patient that they have a lot of wine. And if you have two or three lesions, it's, it's, it's more difficult with a hook wire. Okay, great. So we've got a lot of questions here for, for, for you, Dr. Boon. So uh, Dr. Tong Charon, I think a colleague from um, Thailand, uh, he's asked, uh, do you do a hybrid metastectomy with intra-op ablation? Um, I don't have any experience on the ablation, but for the hybrid metastectomy, in, in terms of uh, localization, I have an experience on, on the localization with using hybrid OR, but for ablation, I don't have uh, experience. Okay, um, so sometimes, uh, uh, at least in, in, in Singapore here, uh, we've our our um, radio uh, our what's this uh, radiologist right now are uh, becoming more aggressive uh, with uh, RFA ablation of lung lesions. So sometimes when the lesion is very deep seated and we want to not do a lobectomy for the patient, we actually mm -hmm. uh, send the patient for an RFA ablation. So. Um, that's what we're doing now. Okay, so Dr. Tony Romas has a question. How do we decide regarding which site to do first for bilateral metastatic lesions? In my experience, I, I tend to do the first one that seems difficult to get off. If I can do the, the, the one that difficult success, so the next site will be the easy one. So it, okay. it depends, yeah. So you do the one that is uh, more lung Difficult resection or less lung resection? Um, not not that part, but in terms of you need to do lobectomy, maybe you worry about the lung lung reserve for the single lung after that. Okay. But uh, in that case, maybe you do the one that simple first, and you wait for the lobectomy for the last the the next session. But I, I think about the term that maybe you. Like a segment tech to me that the lung reserve is quite okay, but it seems too difficult. So I try to attack the, the one that difficult first to make sure that I can do the complete resection in the term of that. Yeah. So there's a few questions on, on, on lymph node sampling um, uh, during the uh, dissection or during the time of uh, metastectomy. So they said, first, first question is from uh, Dr. Kaup in Myanmar, and he asks, is it actually really necessary uh, to do it? And the second question from Dr. Nara basic, uh, Narendran, sorry, Narendran uh, from Malaysia, he asked, he said, does it actually really improve disease-free survival or operative su overall survival? Actually, uh, Dr. Narin, at this part, uh, I'll answer for you, the answer for Dr. Boon. It okay. actually does not improve uh, disease-free survival. It's more for prognostication of the patient. So if you actually get lymph node positive, you know the prognosis is worse for the patient. So you're actually doing it for prognostication. You're not going to improve the history survival or, or overall survival of the patient. But um, uh, Dr. Boon, how about this? Is it actually necessary then if you want to do it? I think the, 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 the thing that I want to, make, to, to emphasize is you need to do like a preoperative limb node staging. If you know that the patient has limb node metastasis, maybe you don't need to do the surgery at all. But anyway, like I said in the slide that there are some Anyway, there are some false uh, negative of the CT or PET CT before the operation. So I normally just do the sampling if, if, if there was a less uh, incident of a metastasis in, in the type of, of a cancer. So I think it's not make any, uh, any complication for the patient much, but uh, the, the information is, is much more important. Okay, great. Uh, Prof, we have a question from uh, Dr. Edgardo from Philippines. Um, he asked now, for benign airway lung tumors, are there any techniques when you um, resect these lesions or you, you take it out, you snare it, uh, to avoid persistent bleeding? Um, <laughs> that's uh, it's a very challenging. That is a very challenging question, and for me, uh, I'm afraid of benign lesions uh, bleeding. 
more more than the malignant lesions. So I take biopsy from malignant lesions with very less bleeding, and just uh, so I, I I do in a weak patient with uh, no 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 sedation, and I I try to let him cough out. So, so in case of uh, diatomy or cautery, it, it can be useful, and some these are uh, if nearby available. So it is quite quite okay, but we have no laser yet, and I I use very cautious uh, for to do biopsy. And the, in case of resection, resection the 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 cautery electro cautery is quite effective, and you can use some spray adrenaline or some packs with the. Uh, but the we can change to the rigid bronchoscope. Actually, this is, uh, I have not, not much experience in, in the endobronchial procedures, and I have no special uh, disaster for that case. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Kazi from Bangladesh, um, he asked a question. He said, uh, he's talking about thyroid cancer patients and a thyroid cancer patient with an extra pulmonary metastasis to the sternum. Uh, would you, how, what would you do? Would you actually work with your colleagues, your endocrine colleagues or your ENT colleagues to do a total thyroidectomy and then would you actually perform excision of the sternal lesion? So you mean that only bone metastasis? Yeah, only bone no, no or metastasis. bone to the, bone to the, the sternum. sternum. Right. Yeah. So I think it depends, is that is this low, only local sternal involvement with the symptoms? I think maybe surgery can offer some, some benefit of a, like a, a symptomatic treatment of the of the lesion, and you can put like a, any material at the sternum. But if there was a lot of bone metastasis, so I don't think this is going to be helped in the survival. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, very correct, actually. Okay, so I'm going to take it. Take the last question today before we conclude, and uh, this is from Dr. Camilo Pada, and uh, he would like to know your experience on metastatic malignant solitary fibrous tumor. Do both of you all have any experience with this? No. No, okay. Uh, Profu? <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, yeah. So it's actually very, very rare um, uh, a lesion, and uh, I think it's difficult to understand. So, okay. Um, I guess I'll conclude today. Um, session and uh, I would like to actually thank uh, Dr. Boon and, and Prof Wu and also Medtronic for uh, sponsoring this, um, this uh, event today and uh, have a great night and we'll see you all next week.